thanks, Chris, for the introduction, and thanks, Amy, for facilitating this. I'm grateful to be speaking here at the OI, and thanks to all of you for coming out to listen to me talk for an hour or so on a chilly Wednesday evening. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, the title, as I've framed it on the screen at the moment, is a little bit broad. Um, too broad, some might say, for a nice condensed talk. So what I intend to do is to narrow down a little bit. And what I really want to focus on is how credit and credit markets impinged on the economic strategies of certain specific actors in Rome's urban economy between the first century BC and the second century AD. And really what I'm going to focus on are artisans and shopkeepers, so people like blacksmiths, goldsmiths, uh, people who sold meat, vegetables, bread, that kind of stuff. And what I'm really interested in is understanding to what extent they relied on credit and how they went about receiving the credit that they needed in order to operate their businesses. And in order to frame my talk, what I'd like to do is uh, show you a, a very small excerpt from some of our Roman legal sources. So this is an excerpt from Justinian's Digest. It's a late compilation of Roman legal writings uh, from earlier periods. So basically you have a bunch of opinions by Roman lawyers on a number of different topics which have been excerpted and compiled into a much larger volume uh, for reference. And here what we have is a Roman lawyer of the second century AD quoting a letter which may have been written by a shopkeeper or an artisan to someone who had extended him credit. And what you have is a fairly straightforward, it seems, set of circumstances in which this artisan or shopkeeper writes to his creditor uh, to basically inform the creditor that the creditor has the sole claim on the slaves in the shop that he's offering as security. Essentially, he's mortgaged this property in order to secure access to the loan. Yet even though those circumstances seem fairly straightforward, the letter actually obscures a lot more than it reveals. Uh, just to point the obvious, it doesn't really tell us what the loan was for. Uh, there's no sense here in this document why the artisan or shopkeeper found it necessary to borrow against the security of his slaves and his shop. And likewise, uh, there's no real indication concerning the identity of the person from whom he borrowed this money. So fundamentally, the passage in itself doesn't really tell us a whole lot about the actual day-to-day -day strategies of artisans and shopkeepers in the Roman world. So what I'd like to do tonight is to think a little bit about how we can get at that aspect of life in antiquity. And in particular, I want to focus on two specific problems. Uh, first of all, how important was credit for Roman artisans and shopkeepers, and to what extent was credit significant in their day-to-day -day business strategies? And second, I want to try to understand how and on what terms they secured access to that credit. Now, this is a, a difficult subject to broach, actually, because much of our evidence isn't much better than what you see on the screen. Uh, the fact of the matter is that artisans in the Roman world between the first century BC and the second century AD did not produce any kind of records that have actually survived, with the exception of some letters and petitions in Roman Egypt uh, that have been preserved nor are they really the subjects of our literary sources or even our legal sources except only peripherally or tangentially. So trying to get a handle on, on what life was like for these people and how they coped with the challenges of the environments in which they found themselves is actually fairly difficult. So my paper tonight is mostly about not just how they actually managed to cope with the kind of problems they experienced, but how we know about these problems in the first place. Uh, the answer I propose is that we have to rely a little bit on comparative evidence to sort of establish a framework that lets us tease out little bits of evidence from our fragmentary ancient sources. So what I'll do tonight is illustrate how one can go about using that kind of comparative evidence to tease out those fragments of evidence. And what I hope to do is basically make a fairly straightforward argument, uh, and that argument is that shopkeepers and artisans really did depend heavily on credit, mostly because they needed it in order to secure access to the working capital that was necessary to operate their businesses on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of them, perhaps like uh, the individual who wrote this letter, may have secured that credit on what we would think of as the credit market, namely by arranging for cash loans from people who were essentially moneylenders. As I hope to suggest, however, that wasn't really the normal strategy. Instead, a lot of artisans and shopkeepers relied instead on much more interpersonal forms of credit which they secured from their suppliers, basically from the people who sold them the goods and services they needed to carry out their businesses. So let me start with the first aspect of this problem. Um, what can we know about the importance of credit in Rome's artisan economy? 
And I suppose one can start by noting that there are a couple of uses for credit you can readily imagine. Uh, one is credit being used to acquire fixed capital, whether it's somebody looking for money to start up a new business or somebody looking to expand his production facilities. Uh, the other use is, of course, working capital, which I've already alluded to. Um, and this is money to cope with the inevitable lag between your outlays as a producer on the raw materials and services you need and the receipts that you eventually generate by selling your products and services. With the help of the comparative evidence, though, uh, we can go a little bit further than that and uh, get into the, the finer details, if we so desire. And what I'm going to do here is use comparative work from 17th and 18th century London, uh, which is a much more thoroughly documented society than Rome of the first century BC through the second century AD, to try to understand the, the problems that artisans and shopkeepers had to contend with. Now, what you can do with the early modern evidence is get a sense of the financial resources at the disposal of a lot of artisans and shopkeepers. And what I've presented you here is a table, hopefully it's legible for those of you in the back, which gives you a sense of what the assets of London businessmen in the late 17th and early 18th century actually looked like. And in particular, I'm interested in the bottom columns, or bottom rows, I'm sorry, where you have textile retailers and artisans. And if you take a casual glance at that, and at the third column in particular, the one labeled stocks and fixed assets, you'll see that according to Peter Earle, who went through all these probate records, artisans and shopkeepers tended to maintain somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of their assets in the form of what Earle labels as stocks and fixed assets. That actually turns out to be a little bit deceptive, uh, because as Earle notes in the text that accompanies this chart, in most cases, the stocks that they maintained were a lot more significant in their portfolios than were the actual fixed assets that they used. And that's simply because you're dealing with an economy in which uh, most people rely on handicraft production. So unless you are a brewer, for example, or some other kind of producer that needs a lot of really expensive fixed capital, most of the stuff lying around your shop is actually going to be raw materials or finished or semi-finished goods rather than expensive implements of production. So in actual fact, uh, the fixed capital that most artisans have at their disposal is actually a much smaller fraction than, of their assets than this table would suggest, maybe somewhere on the order of 10 to 12 percent. Right? Stocks are roughly on the same order of magnitude, uh, but working capital extends beyond stocks, actually, and what you get is that fourth column labeled trade credits. These are essentially accounts receivable. Uh, it's credit that these artisans and shopkeepers have extended to their clients and have not yet received. And that, if you look at this table, actually constitutes a, a fairly astonishing proportion of their assets. In the case of textile retailers, for example, in Earl's table, it's a, a total of 43%. The prominence of the trade credits in these asset portfolios really reflects a couple of endemic problems in the economies of advanced agrarian societies, which London in the 18th century still was. And really, there are two problems that sort of necessitated uh, this kind of credit extension. One was the fact that the currency supply was not necessarily adequate to the volume of commerce that took place on a day-to-day -day basis. And the second, of course, is that the income of most in, uh, urban consumers, rather, tended to be intermittent and sometimes just completely irregular. It was intermittent because you're dealing with an economy that is still linked to the seasonal rhythms of agriculture. And it was irregular because, in some sense, it was an underdeveloped economy in which people's incomes and sources of employment were somewhat unpredictable. Uh, and what this actually meant was that there was a huge demand on the part of urban consumers for some device with which they could smooth their consumption, simply because they didn't have the ready money on hand necessarily on any given day to buy the things they needed in order to survive or buy the things they wanted. In the early modern economy, artisans and shopkeepers were fairly quick to take advantage of that, uh, and they saw basically the device of offering sales credit as a means with which they could increase their own turnover, uh, basically by encouraging people to buy from them by deferring payment until later. The concomitant of this, of course, is that they placed increasing strain on their own reserves of working capital. Um, I've already mentioned the fact that you've already got a lag period between the moment at which you make the payments on the raw materials and so on that you need to run your business and the moment at which you collect the receipts. And by offering train, or trade credit, rather, they were extending that window 
and making it necessary for themselves to find ways to get their hands on the working capital they needed to make it through that gap. So what you in fact find is that a lot of these artisans and shopkeepers are not just suppliers of credit, they're also consumers of credit on a fairly large scale. And what Earl found when he looked at these probate inventories was that the average liabilities of London businessmen in this period amounted to about 25% of the value of their gross assets. Uh, but as he points out, that's somewhat misleading, and the actual value was probably a little bit higher, simply because the probate inventories themselves were drawn up long enough after the death of the individuals in question that the executors of the estates had had time to pay down some of that debt. So in actual fact, you're looking at a, an environment in which artisans and shopkeepers probably regularly carried liabilities on the order of a third or more of the value of their gross assets. Now, as a comparative model, uh, what this brief sketch of how credit worked in the early modern economy allows us to do is to hypothesize or ask whether or not Roman artisans found themselves engaging in networks of credit in basically the same way. As I've mentioned, uh, the evidence that we have at our disposal makes it difficult to get a handle on this in any kind of really detailed way. But what I want to do for the next 20 minutes or so is make an argument that when you look very carefully at some of our surviving evidence, you can see hints that artisans in the Roman world, like artisans in the early modern period, both provided credit to their own clients and, conversely, were consumers of credit in their own right because they needed the credit to basically give themselves the reserves of working capital they needed in order to make this whole scheme work. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about the reasons we think that this was true. Uh, one is an argument based on structure, what kinds of factors in the ancient economy generated the demand for consumption smoothing and this kind of credit in the first place from the perspective of urban consumers. And the other two are evidence-based arguments in which I will actually look at some of the fragmentary bits of evidence we have for the credit relationships of artisans and shopkeepers. So let's start with the argument from structure. Um, I'm going to pass over the question of the currency supply in the Roman world because that's a very vexed problem, and it's actually pretty difficult to get a handle on how much small change in particular was floating around in any given moment. I think I can do that because even if the money supply in terms of hard currency was a little bit better in the ancient world than it was in the early modern period, the ancient world was still subject to a whole host of seasonalities and uncertainties that ensured that urban consumers didn't always have the ready money they needed at hand in order to fund their consumption. And one can think about this in terms of both seasonal factors and uncertainties and irregularities. As far as seasonal factors go, it's worth pointing out that people who derive most of their income from real estate, whether agricultural real estate or even urban real estate, obviously collected income that they could get and then spend in the cities only at certain moments of the year. So if you were a rich Roman aristocrat exploiting your own properties directly, you generated income mostly in the period between, let's say, late June and probably sometime in October, uh, which is the window of time in which the harvest periods of the various Mediterranean staple crops fell due, starting with grain, then grapes, and then olives. But even if you were a wealthy Roman who owned urban property, your income tended to come in in uh, fairly narrow windows during the year. As far as we can tell, based on the legal evidence, Roman landlords who leased out urban property generally collected their rents once a year, uh, July 1st. So that, too, was a fairly intermittent source of income. That's fairly easy to grasp, I think, conceptually. But it's important to stress that even people who generated their income by producing goods and services within cities themselves also suffered from various kinds of seasonal factors that meant that their income was not uh, even throughout the year. And there are a variety of, of reasons that this was true. Um, first of all, if you think about the average urban consumer, um, somebody who made a living as a blacksmith or an artisan, for example, uh, these are people who spend a lot of their money on basic foodstuffs, and in particular, grain. And the thing about grain, especially in the ancient world, is that its price tends to fluctuate throughout the course of the year. It's relatively low immediately after the harvest in June or July, and it steadily climbs over the course of the year as stocks get depleted until you get to the next harvest. And by then, it can be much more expensive than it was earlier on in the cycle, maybe by a factor of two or in a bad year, even three. And what this means from the perspective of someone 
for whom grain constitutes a large chunk of your budget, is that your purchasing power, or at least the amount you can devote to things that are not foodstuffs, actually varies quite a bit over the year, and it will decrease, essentially, from the harvest over the rest of the year. Likewise, people who are working at this level, um, you know, your average working member of the population, also found that opportunities for employment tended to be seasonal. One reason for this was simply the weather, which actually infected employment in a couple of main sectors of the economy. One were the building trade. There was a lot of building in Rome, uh, especially in the imperial period when the emperors are funding public construction all over the place. But as far as we can tell, there was distinct seasonal rhythm to the building trade, uh, especially since the Romans used a lot of cement or concrete. It didn't set very well when it was cold, so there tended to be a, a lull in the building in the winter months because, of course, even though Italy is much warmer than, say, Chicago is in the winter, it can still frost, and that can interfere with building activities. And it would pick up in the summer months. So there's a trough in the middle part of the year and a, a peak in employment and construction, which paid a lot of people in the summer. Likewise, a lot of people found work in the industries that were involved in transporting goods from the two main ports of Rome in the imperial period, Ostia and Portus, up through the city. So you have to think of thousands of people here who found employment as stevedores, longshoremen, and as porters and bargemen moving goods up the Tiber River. And there, too, there's a distinctly seasonal rhythm to this kind of work, since the Mediterranean sailing season ran from sometime in the spring till sometime in the fall. And in the winter, although ships did still move around, it was quite a bit more dangerous to actually move goods uh, because storms and fog could really ruin your day, um, as the shipwreck story of Paul, for example, in the New Testimony uh, tells us. So the weather, in fact, created a lot of seasonal patterns in employment and thus in the income that people were able to spend on urban goods. And finally, there's a lot of uh, seasonal, or social seasonality, rather. And I've got a couple of slides to illustrate this, just because I think it's, it's one of the more interesting aspects of life in a big city in an advanced agrarian economy, which never did manage to divorce itself from various kinds of rhythms of the agricultural calendar. Uh, from what we can tell, Rome was a much busier place in the winter than it was in the summer at least among the aristocratic clientele, although the pattern may have been reversed for reasons that I'll talk about in a second among uh, members of what we would think of as the working population. And the evidence for this are just little asides that we find, uh, incidental references in some of our texts. What I've got here are two of the most important ones, both of which are incidental references in letters of Pliny the Younger. In the first one, he just happens to casually mention that January is a time of year when there are lots and lots of people in Rome, especially lots of wealthy aristocrats, members of the Senate and so on. The reason for that is because January was important politically in terms of elections. So you get a lot of people coming basically to participate in that particular process. Uh, the summer, not so much. Conversely, the next passage seems to suggest that the summer actually was a relatively quiet time. And if you were a, a, an aristocrat like Pliny and you wanted to have a literary salon, that was a perfect time to do it because there wasn't a lot of legal business uh, in particular. This is what Pliny focuses on, presumably because there weren't a lot of people in town to actually bring suits to court. So you get a sense in these two passages that there really is a distinct ebb and flow in the population of a city like Rome and therefore in the number of consumers who are on hand at any given point in order to buy stuff from artisans and shopkeepers. So that directly affects their income. And you can complement that with a couple of other pieces of evidence. So here I have some little fragments from Suetonius's biography of the Emperor Augustus. And here Suetonius like Pliny, sort of mentions casually that there are uh, moments during the agricultural year when there probably weren't a lot of wealthy senators floating around in Rome. Uh, he focuses on two moments. One is the official senatorial recess. Uh, this is the second passage there, which occurred during September and October. And this is a moment in the year at which a lot of aristocrats seem to have left Rome. But likewise, the law courts seem to have wound down Starting probably in August, you started to see a lot less legal business in September and October. And then in November and December, in the reign of Augustus, the courts were quiet, basically. And rich Romans who served on law courts uh, tended not to be around necessarily during this particular part of the year. The reason for that is uh, linked to a couple of factors. 
Uh, one is the fact that a lot of these wealthy aristocrats are, of course, making a big chunk of their money from their agricultural estates. And it behooved them on some level to be present during critical operations of the year when they may have had to renegotiate leases with their tenants and things like that. Uh, but the other reason is that Rome was a really unpleasant and really quite dangerous place late in the summer. And it was so because of malaria, which peaked right around the end of August or early September. Um, malaria on its own will not necessarily kill you, but it will make you a lot more vulnerable to things like tuberculosis and various kind of nasty gastrointestinal diseases and parasites that float around a big crowded city like Rome. And when you look at uh, what we can discern of mortality patterns, it seems there's a lot more mortality in August and September in Rome than there was at other points of the year. Rich Romans recognized this, and for that reason, even though they didn't know why mortality tended to get worse at this time of year, they thought that the summer was a good time for getting out of town, basically. So you end up with a, a big lull in the calendar in which a lot of aristocratic rich clients aren't there to actually spend money on the goods of urban, urban artisans and retailers. Likewise, there are reasons why people who belong to what we might think of as the working population would, would want to move in and out of the city at various times of the year as well. And those reasons are largely linked to ebbs and flows in employment opportunities in various sectors of the ancient labor market. Uh, as far as we can tell, a lot of people from cities went off to find work as harvest labor during certain times of the year. And conversely, farmers would come into the city uh, during lulls in the agricultural calendar to pick up casual work in the town. And there are bits and pieces of evidence that kind of get at that dynamic, and I've got two of them posted up on the screen here. The first one is interesting simply because it shows us that the Roman state recognized at some point that the harvest season in particular was a moment at which people might be drawn out of the city and might not want to come into the city. Uh, the second passage, even though it comes from a slightly later period than my own, comes from uh, the late antique period, is nevertheless interesting because here the situation is one in which Germanus of Auxerre happens to encounter a couple of migrant laborers while he's crossing the Alps from Gaul back into Italy. Um, they're called fabri in the text, which probably means something like carpenter or stonemason. And what the text suggests is that they had been working abroad for a little bit and were coming home. What's significant is that they're coming home uh, at this feast, right, um, the feast of these two saints, which we happen to know was on June 19th, which is right around the time of the harvest. So it makes it seem a lot like these are people who have farms in Italy, who leave Italy uh, during lulls in the agricultural calendar to go off and find work elsewhere. So you have to imagine like, that people like this probably f flowed into Rome in fairly large numbers at certain times of the year. And just like artisans and shopkeepers who catered to wealthy clients found that the volume of their business ebbed and flowed over the course of the year, so too did those who catered to members of the working population. Now, if this weren't complicated enough already, uh, in addition to these kinds of seasonal factors that affected the timing and rate at which people received income, there were a whole host of uncertainties that could also make an even fiercer mess of things from the perspective of people who actually lived and worked in Rome. Uh, one of these was the interannual variability of rainfall in the Mediterranean world, which translated directly into the extent of the harvest in any given year. And this could be quite variable from year to year, which meant that apart from this problem you had where the grain price actually went up over the course of the year, uh, grain could also be more expensive from one year to the next. So an income that gave you plenty left over to spend on things that weren't food in one year might not be enough to get by in the next year. So that's one problem. Another problem has to do with uh, what I would call the particular consumption habits of wealthy Roman aristocrats who really were a major segment of the market for the products of Roman artisans and for the goods that retailers sold in their shops. And what I mean by that is that a lot of Roman aristocrats, when they wanted to purchase an article, uh, because they're living in a culture that prioritizes conspicuous consumption, they didn't simply walk into a shop and buy something off the rack. Right? They went to an artisan and ordered something on a bespoke basis, basically ordered something to commission. Uh, and in this way, they were able to sort of display their taste and, and status and so on. And from the point of view of an artisan, this can be problematic because you never really know from one moment to the next whether the whims of your aristocratic clients are going to dictate that they come in and visit your shop on any given day. And we're actually very fortunate in that we have some allusions in our sources to what this may have looked like from the perspective of members of the actual working population. 
Uh, these are little fragments that I've drawn from one of my favorite pieces of ancient literature. It's a handbook on the interpretation of dreams. It was written by a guy named Artemidorus of Daldus, a Greek writer who lived in the 2nd century AD. And his job was basically to hang out in the agora or the forum of towns in Italy and in Greece and tell people what their dreams meant. And he was nice enough to write a book that sort of explained his principles of interpretation for us and, and give a lot of examples. And why it's useful for me is because Artemidorus believed that you couldn't really understand what a dream meant unless you took into account a whole bunch of personal attributes about the dreamer. So, for instance, a dream would mean something different to a man than it did to a woman on a very simple level. Likewise, it would mean something different to a senator than it did to an artisan or a shopkeeper. And in point of fact, Ar Artemidorus actually provides a couple of examples of dream interpretations that are targeted directly at artisans and shopkeepers. And if you go through them, you notice something interesting. Most of them really sort of focus on the problem of whether or not these people would have enough work in any given year to get by. And it really comes out in two ways, the dreams that presage good employment conditions and the dreams that presage bad, un or bad employment conditions. The first passage is obviously an example of the former, and here the interpretation is fairly straightforward. If an artisan dreams that he's got more than two hands, it means that he's going to have more work than he can actually manage himself. Right? Lots and lots of business, which is great because it means he'll have lots and lots of income. Conversely, if he dreams that he's wearing fancy white clothing in particular, it means he's not going to have much work at all because this is not the sort of stuff that you would wear to your workshop. And Artemidorus, Artemidorus goes on to mention that the costlier and fancier the clothing and the dream, the worse and more prolonged that period of unemployment is going to be. And just this really gets at that idea that from the perspective of agents on the ground, uh, the economy was pretty unpredictable most of the time. Income was irregular. Uh, and if you did want to purchase things, or conversely, if you wanted to sell things to clients, you had to think fairly creatively about how to make that happen when people didn't necessarily have the coin at hand in order to actually make purchases for cash. So that leads me to the second component of my argument in this first part of my paper. Um, and that is an argument that has to do with the evidence we have for sales on credit. We can sort of imagine, just based on the comparative evidence, that since ancient artisans had to cope with the same kind of problems that their early modern counterparts did, they too may have found it necessary or desirable to entice purchases from clients by offering credit rather than by demanding cash up front. And in fact, when you go through some of our evidence, you actually do find bits and pieces of material that tend to support that, even though they do so only elliptically and incidentally. Um, the mechanics of buying things were not really of that much interest to people who were writing philosophical texts or even literature like plays. Um, what I've got here is one of the most interesting fragments of this kind of material. It's an excerpt from a comedic play by Plautus, who was writing in the second century BCE. And what you have here is a, a, an excerpt from a longer speech that Plautus writes for one of his characters a wealthy guy named Megadorus. And it's a speech in which Megadorus waxes eloquent on the dangers of marrying well-dowered women. And what Megadorus essentially does is complain that the danger with well-dowered women and rich wives is that they like to spend lots and lots of money. And they like to spend it in the shops of artisans and retailers. And he goes through and mentions a whole bunch of them. I've given you just a very small sample of the kinds of people that he mentions. The list goes on and on and on and on and on, right? Fullers, woolen merchants, um, jewelers, and so on and so forth. That's all very interesting, but what's really kind of interesting for my purpose now is the punchline, as it were. Uh, it's, not, it's not simply that the wife goes out and spends all this money on trinkets. It's that when the husband comes home, all of the people from whom she's purchased on credit are basically crowded into his atrium demanding to be paid back, and really that's sort of the punchline here. Uh, but what's interesting, I think, really is that assumption that this is a normal course of business in the Roman marketplace. If you went into the shop of an artisan or a retailer who's trafficking in this kind of stuff, you wouldn't necessarily be expected to pay in cash. Right? You would pay on account instead. And you can complement this with fragments from other bits of literary text that suggest that this is a pretty persistent feature of Roman economic life right from the day of Plautus in the second century BC up until the earlier imperial period. And I've got just two other examples here. Uh, the first is an excerpt from 
the Ars Amatoria of Ovid, and this is very similar to the Plotus passage, right? The joke, once again, is that if you link up with, you know, a woman from a certain kind of background with expensive tastes, you can be expected to face a lot of pressure to buy her stuff. And here, too, the humor derives from the fact that people can't get out of buying things for their girlfriends by pretending that they don't have any coin on hand, because what happens is the vendor will say, that's no problem, you just have to make your little mark in my ledger here and we'll conclude a credit sale. And so again, the underlying assumption is that it's actually really easy uh, for people to buy things on credit and that these artisans and retailers are using credit sales as a way to enhance their turnover. The second passage on this particular slide extends that idea a little bit further down the social scale by talking about a shoemaker who does the same thing, sells stuff on credit from his shop. And here you have a Pythagorean philosopher who goes in to buy a new pair of shoes discover he doesn't have the four denarii on hand that he needs to buy it, and is able to buy them on credit from the shoemaker, go on his way, and come back a couple of weeks later and try to pay that artisan back. We don't have any hardcore, I guess, documentary evidence of the practice, and that's mostly because things like account books haven't survived, right? Um, one exception might be this kind of thing. This is a piece of graffiti from Pompeii, and it's basically a list of comestibles scrolled on the wall in one of the archways in the Colosseum, uh, things like bread and oil. So you get the bread and the oil uh, in the left part of the column, and then to the right you get a numeral, two or three or S, which means a half, which follows as, which is a bronze coin. Um, and every now and then it's punctuated, as it is on line nine, and line 14 by a notation that says, I have accepted a certain amount of money from somebody. So this looks for all the world like an account that somebody's keeping, an open purchase account, if you want to think about it that way. Maybe an account kept by a shopkeeper who was tallying up stuff he was selling to somebody on credit and then balancing it out when that client came in basically to pay him back. Beyond that, for more real world evidence, I guess we have to turn to the legal evidence. And I should stress that this is not real-world evidence in the sense that it documents necessarily an actual event. Uh, but what you do have are the opinions of lawyers who, I think, realistically are coping with real-world problems and trying to sort out the complications that can arise when one sells goods on credit. Selling goods on credit was itself not complicated from a legal standpoint. It was perfectly fine. Uh, but it could complicate other kinds of legal problems that could arise just in the course of life. And this passage demonstrates that pretty clearly. Uh, what's going on here is that a testator has bequeathed a workshop, a purple seller's workshop, to his son as a legacy. And the problem is that the recipient of that legacy got into an argument with the primary heir of the estate over what exactly that legacy consisted of. And in particular, what was at stake was whether or not it was just the shop and its slave employees or all the other stuff associated with the management of the shop, not just the money put aside to buy materials and so on, but what Papinian calls the debita and the reliqua, which I've translated here as the debits and the sums outstanding. Uh, the sums outstanding here obviously must be what we would think of as accounts receivable uh, generated by the managers of the shop who extend trading credits to their clients. Right? The other good chunk of evidence comes from a, a body of law or a body of legal opinion concerning problems that could arise when slaves operated businesses. Again, it wasn't really problematic for a slave to run a business in ancient Rome. And the, the law came up with ways to facilitate this. Essentially, what a slave owner could do was give his slave what the Romans called a peculium, basically a separate account which could consist of money, movables, real estate, anything really. And the slave could then use that as the seed capital to run a business. What got complicated was the degree of liability that a slaveholder assumed when he did this. And the problem was that transactions between a third party and a slave technically had no legal force because the slave couldn't alienate things in his own right. So what the Romans had to do was come up with various devices that allowed people who contracted with slaves to sue the master instead, including this thing that I've labeled here as the Actio Tributoria. Uh, this was basically a legal device that allowed you to sue the master of a slave whose business had become insolvent and basically force the master to liquidate business assets in the peculium and distribute the proceeds among creditors of the business. And again, what's kind of interesting in this particular passage is that the jurists argued that one ought to consider among those assets outstanding trade credits that the shopkeeper or the artisan had extended to his clients. 
Right? So again, that gets at the idea that people who actually run these shops are selling a lot of goods on credit. This is just a passage to further refine what we can tell about this particular process. And really what I wanted to illustrate through this is a very simple principle. Um, when the jurists imagine a slave running a business, that business could consist of a lot of things. It could be wholesaling, it could be banking, and so on. But for the purposes of talking about the Actio Tributoria and people suing the owners of slaves in the case of a slave business that had gone bankrupt, the specific examples that they give really are rooted in the world of artisans and shopkeepers. And this is a great example. What you have here are specific references to cloak-making businesses and linen-weaving businesses, which, again, just really gets at this idea that manufacturers in particular are relying on credit sales as a way to get around the problem that people don't have ready money, and they're extending credit to their clients. But the concomitant of this, obviously, is the fact that artisans and shopkeepers who did this once again put strain on their own reserves of working capital, and they probably had to look to some kind of credit in order to finance their businesses. We can just imagine that that was the case on the basis of the comparative evidence once again and on the basis of what we can intuit of their behavior as suppliers of credit. And once again, if you go through some of the legal evidence and some of the literary evidence, you can find odd references to the kinds of liabilities that artisans and shopkeepers may have acquired in the course of managing their businesses. And these little references suggest that those liabilities could be quite high, maybe somewhere on the order of the 30% or so that was typical among London businessmen in a much later historical period. Uh, one example is actually the slide that I showed you just a couple of seconds ago, um, this, this business about the purple shop. Right? Not only are the outstanding trade credits a focus of dispute in this particular lawsuit. So too are the debts that the shop has run up, basically that its slave managers have run up in operating the business. And one here, I think, can legitimately postulate that these debts that are mentioned here are debts uh, acquired in the process of getting their hands on raw materials and so on. Oh, I actually have it on the top of this slide, so I didn't have to backtrack anyway, but there you have it. Uh, the second passage just reiterates this point, uh, but this takes it beyond the realm of slave-run businesses and moves back into the world of the freeborn artisans, uh, just so you don't think that this kind of credit strategy is purely uh, a tool used by slave artisans. Uh, here we have another reference from Artemidorus' interpretation on the Manual of Dreams. Um, it's a passage that he brings up for reasons that have nothing really to do with urban economy. What he's interested in doing is uh, illustrating a principle of his, his analytical technique. And he's making a point here that if you have a dream in which you see a figure that shares a certain attribute, like he has the same occupation as you, then the interpretation is actually fairly straightforward. Whatever happens to that person in the dream is probably going to happen to you too. And he illustrates that point by throwing in a real-world example about a carpenter in Sisychus, uh, a Greek city in what's now western Turkey. And what he says is that a carpenter there had a dream that his next-door neighbor, who was also a carpenter, died and was carried out of his house. And for Artemidorus, this later proved to be self-evidently prophetic because what happened is that the carpenter in question who had the dream essentially went bankrupt and was forced to abandon his shop because of pressure from his creditors. And so here you might be looking at an example of an artisan who incurred sufficient enough liabilities in the process of trying to manage his building that he actually couldn't pay off his debts and his building basically collapsed as his creditors tried to make good on what he owed them. So to sum up so far, what I've basically tried to do in the first section of the talk here is make the argument that there are a lot of reasons for thinking that artisans and shopkeepers in cities of the Roman Empire, and in Rome in particular, did depend quite heavily on credit, uh, specifically to get their hands on the working capital they needed to operate their businesses, and particularly in view of the fact that they placed strain on their own working capital by extending credit to their own clients. <clears throat> What I want to do in the next part of the talk is say a few things about how they may have secured the credit that they needed in order to manage their businesses, uh, what the sources of that credit were, and what the terms were on which they may have acquired it. And I'll introduce this topic just by pointing out um, what we may have suspected anyway, that of course one of the things they could do if they wanted to was go and contract for a cash loan from a professional or semi-professional moneylender. 
And these two examples on the screen right now kind of show you that we do have some evidence that that took place. Uh, the first is a passage I've already showed you. It's this letter again with which I opened my talk in which you have an artisan arranging for a loan on the basis of the security of his own property. Uh, the second presents a bit of a variant on that. In this particular case, you get a dealer who secures a loan in order to buy some raw materials, in this case, marble slabs, and does so by then mortgaging the mar marble slabs themselves back to his creditor. But in both cases, you have what are essentially cash loans arranged by artisans or dealers. And we also know a little bit about the kinds of institutions that supported this. Uh, we know a little bit about the credit market, in other words. And there were a number of professional lenders who operated in Rome and in other cities of the Roman Empire. And they were willing to lend out money in one of three ways, typically. Uh, first, there were people who were straight-up brokers, I would call them, who arranged meetings between people with surplus capital to hand and people who needed money. So for a fee, they would put you in touch if you were a businessman with somebody who had the money you needed if you wanted to borrow a big hump of cash to go buy some new fixed installation or to buy some raw materials. Alternatively, you could go to a money lender, and these were usually people, the Romans called them finaratores, who lent out basically their own resources at interest and generated profits from the interest that they charged in order to borrow the money. And finally, you could go to a professional banker. In the Roman world, a professional banker was somebody who took deposits and provided certain services to his clients, like arranging payments and so on. But of course, what they also did was use some of the deposits they had on hand to make loans, once again, at interest. And so there are all of these professional money lenders, and it seems that they did a pretty vigorous trade at certain well-known points in the city of Rome. So if you wanted to arrange a loan, you knew exactly where to go, and you knew where you could find someone who could, who could make this work for you. But there were other ways to get the credit that you needed. Um, and this passage offers a pretty good illustration of what those alternative ways were. Uh, basically, the alternative to going and arranging a cash loan on the credit market per se was to interlink that credit transaction with some other kind of transaction, uh, more particularly to seek credit from the people who were selling you your raw materials in the first place. And this passage sort of illustrates the way in which this could unfold. This, too, is a, a passage in which Ulpian is worried about legal implications of this process I talked about earlier, the Actio Tributoria. And the specific circumstance he imagines is one in which a slave business has gone bankrupt and one of the people who has been supplying raw materials or goods to that business can actually point to items in the store and say, that's mine. I provided it to the shopkeeper. Uh, since it's still here, can't I just take it and be satisfied that way? And Ulpian's answer is, well, maybe, maybe not. It depends precisely on what you did when you gave it to him. Did you actually arrange credit formally by noting it in your ledger, or did you just say, yeah, sure, just pay me back whenever? Um, if you noted it formally in the register, then the sale has actually been legally completed, and you are a creditor in the same position as any other creditor. So you have to be satisfied with liquidation and a share of the proceeds. Those details are actually not what's important about this passage. Again, what's most important about this passage is the underlying assumption, namely that these artisans and shopkeepers are actually buying stuff from their own supplier on credit. Right? So we have two basic modes of operation. One is that you go and seek a loan. The other is that you actually look for credit from your suppliers. And our question, and really the analytical problem here, is to determine whether or not we can say that Roman artisans and shopkeepers preferred one strategy to the other, they were more likely to go seek a loan, or they were more likely to rely on somebody like a supplier. And here the direct evidence is pretty bad. Right, so we can't rely on a, a purely inductive approach. What you have to do is turn instead to comparative evidence to sort of illuminate the possibilities and think a little bit about whether or not those possibilities worked out in the same way in the Roman context as they did in later historical periods. And what I've given you here on the screen is an excerpt from uh, the autobiography of Francis Place, who started off as a small-scale tailor uh, producing bespoke menswear in London of the late 18th century and carried his career forward into the early 19th century. And in this particular passage, he's talking a little bit about how he built up credit networks in the early stages of his career. Right? And what he basically describes is a process in which he carefully created relationships with certain people who could supply him credit. And what's significant here is that none of these people are professional money lenders. 
right? Instead, the people he names are mercers and woolen drapers. So these are people from whom he was buying materials directly and who would sell him goods on credit, probably short-term credit on the order of three or six months. And that's a pattern that actually carried through into Francis Place's later career when, as a very successful tailor, he continued to buy a lot of raw materials on credit from suppliers like that. Now, what makes that particularly puzzling is that this was not actually always the most cost-effective strategy for artisans or shopkeepers to adopt. And the reason we think that is because there are a couple of indications in the early modern evidence that it actually cost more in the long run to buy something on credit for a supplier than it did to arrange a loan. Uh, a supplier would offer you prices. He'd offer you his three-month price, his six-month price, and his 12-month price. And the longer the credit you wanted, the higher the purchase price was. Uh, and there's a pawnbroker in the 18th century who kind of complained about this and wrote a little pamphlet. And one of the claims he made, according to Earl, uh, from whom, again, this table comes, is that it would have been cheaper for artisans to use his services because the interest he charged on the loans he made in his pawn shop was actually lower than the premium that suppliers tended to add to the sale price of their goods for short-term credit. And that raises a question. Um, presumably, artisans were likely aware of this, so why did they prefer to work through suppliers rather than to take cash loans? And I think there are two ways that one can think this through. The first has to do with access to credit markets. Credit markets per se, that is, the kind of credit that's made available by formal money lenders. And as the pawnbroker probably would have been quick to concede, in order to get credit from him, you had to put up security. After all, this is what a pawnbroker does. He offers loans on the security of real items. And if I flip back, actually, to the evidence from the ancient world here, uh, this evidence for credit markets, of course, what's significant about these two passages in that both case, security is being used to guarantee the loan. That can be problematic for an artisan or a shopkeeper. And it can be problematic for two reasons. One is that, once again, if you revisit this table that gives you the asset breakdown of London businessmen, artisans and shopkeepers did not necessarily have sufficient collateral to fund the kind of credit that they needed. Right? If we're imagining that a lot of them carried liabilities equivalent to about a third of their gross assets, um, that's a value that exceeds everything here except for the value of the trade credits that they have, which are not necessarily real assets that you can pledge as security in the first place. So it was not necessarily easy for artisans to gain access to the formal credit market if the sum they needed was actually relatively large. So that's one factor that may come into play. The other factor that may come into play is one that has to do with risk. If we imagine a context in which somebody arranges a loan, um, as in the first passage here, by putting up his slaves as security, um, what essentially happens is that the creditor arguably has an incentive to execute on that security if the borrower goes into default, especially if you're using slaves as collateral. Slaves in the Roman world are expensive. They're valuable pieces of human capital. Um, they're also very movable, so it's easy to basically turn them into cash on the marketplace. And this sets up a situation in which artisans who are borrowing money on the security of goods like this actually have a danger, encounter real danger, that they'll lose some of their valuable assets. By contrast, if you do it the Francis Place way, um, that is this way, whoops, not this way, this way, and you set up relationships with a handful of suppliers you make it possible for yourself to exploit what economists would, I suppose, call relational contracting. Um, so basically, this is a situation in which you engage in fairly regular transactions with another party, and in which the ongoing health of that relationship becomes beneficial to both transactional partners. In this particular context, both have an interest in seeing that relationship succeed. Um, from the point of view of the supplier, suppliers love having regular customers to whom they can sell their raw materials. And they may be willing to renegotiate terms of payment if their clients fall upon hard times or get themselves into a bit of a pickle by giving them a bit of a grace period. They're probably more likely to be able or willing to negotiate that kind of payment scheme than somebody who can execute immediately on the security of a valuable good like a slave. 
So part of the reason for understanding why Francis Place may have operated this way is because from his point of view, it was simply safer to rely on people whom he knew and whom he felt he could deal with uh, if things didn't work out according to plan. Now, what this permits us to do is to speculate, hypothesize maybe if we're being really generous, that the same was essentially true in the Roman world and that when Roman artisans and shopkeepers looked for the credit they needed to run their, to run their businesses, they preferred to secure that credit by relying on suppliers rather than by seeking loans um, from professional moneylenders. I can't actually prove that. Um, what I can do is point to little bits of evidence that might at least be consistent with that particular interpretation. And I'll start with this uh, really quickly. This is an interesting document. It's one of the few pieces of documentary evidence that survives recording the activities of a Roman banker. In this case, a guy named Lucius Caecilius Eucundus. And what Lucius Caecilius Eucundus did was advance short-term credit to people who bought goods at auction. So here you see him advancing a sum, or actually rather, yes, advancing a sum to the seller of a lot of boxwood, uh, the kind of thing that a carpenter making high-end furniture might have bought at auction. Now, what's significant here is that these are the kinds of transactions that you might expect would take place between people who didn't normally have a lot of regular contacts with one another, um, because a lot of these auctions take place in the context of periodic markets or busy port towns, as at Pompeii. So what you can imagine here, I think, are itinerant traders who come through with lots of goods trying to sell them. And if you're an artisan who doesn't have a pre-existing relationship with somebody like that, it's going to be hard for you to secure credit from him. So what you do instead is turn to an intermediary like... Eucundus and use a monetary loan in this particular circumstance. But in your day-to-day -day operations, when you're probably dealing with people with whom you have some kind of relationship, you probably default to supplier credit. And so that's one piece of evidence that's maybe consistent with this model that I've advocated here. And I think, uh, just to wrap it up really quickly, there are a couple of other pieces that you can throw out that are more or less consistent with that same model. Um, the first one, once again, goes back to legalistic discussions about what to do when a slave-run enterprise goes bankrupt and how exactly do you liquidate the assets in the shop and distribute it among the creditors. And what's interesting here is that Ulpian does acknowledge that sometimes goods in the shop of a slave who has gone bankrupt will have been pledged as security to one creditor in specific. And in that particular sense, you can imagine that some of these goods were purchased with cash loans that somebody acquired from an intermediary like Eucundus. But this seems to have been the exception. Uh, instead, the Actio Tributoria itself was set up specifically to give a remedy, it seems, to creditors who did not have a security interest in anything that was hanging around in an artisan or shopkeeper's place of business. Um, that's why you go through the whole process of liquidating everything there and distributing the process amongst creditors. So the very fact that you have to come up with a remedy like this in the first place suggests to me that a lot of the credit involved in running these businesses was unsecured and thus possibly credit secured from suppliers rather than credit secured on the formal credit market from people who are basically making cash loans available. And just finally to conclude and to sort of wrap it up in a circle around to where we began, I think that that model also allows us to nuance our interpretation of the passage with which I opened this talk in the first place. Um, one of the things that strikes me as interesting here is that the author of the letter at the end places a lot of emphasis on his relationship, or not on his relationship, I'm sorry, on his reputation and on the fact that the creditor can trust him. Um, he, it's a Greek letter and he uses the word euskimon, which means, you know, respectable or something like that. Um, you can trust me with your funds. Um, what's funny, of course, is that his trustworthiness is not really the main issue here and not really what enables him to, to get the loan. What enables him to get the loan is the security. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to understand what role trust plays just from this passage alone or why it's stressed so heavily in other fragments in which artisans speak to us briefly in their own voice. And I think one way of kind of decoding that is to imagine that reputation and trust is one of the things that enabled you to renegotiate terms of credit with suppliers if maybe you got a little bit behind on your payments. Uh, the danger in this situation is that if you had a lot of creditors and you started defaulting on too many payments, everybody would start to worry that you were just no good anymore and they'd swoop in to sort of get what they could before you completely went bust. 
If, however, you're generally known as somebody who is usually pretty reliable, you might have been able to defer that process a little bit, nudge it down the line in the hope of drawing in some of your own receipts and living to sell again another day. And with that, I think I'll leave it here. And as is traditional, I think I'm perfectly happy to entertain questions for the next few minutes. Thank you.